quick introduction, Gary, and the skills of organisation for inviting me along here tonight, and thank you for coming. So I hope the speech is really interested in how we lead through the public service. And you need to be interested because the way that we lead through the public service is a critical enabler for us in delivering their services for everyone who lives in this country. So that's really important. Before I get going, I just want to find out who's sitting here. So I was wondering if you could put your hand up to me if you are a public student or a retired public student. And 
9-11 was just another day, and we were trying to recover from the share market crash, but we hadn't yet had the kind of global financial crisis that we've suffered from recently. Lots of things are different, but internet was not commercially available. So there was no blogging, there was no LinkedIn, there was no Twittering, none of that existed, it was a really different place. And in 1988, the State Sector Act was passed, and this made the public service a really different place as well. So under the State Sector Act, government department heads became directly accountable to their ministers. And chief executives went on fixed term contracts. And those chief executives and ministers negotiated purchase agreements. So effectively, the ministers decided what they were going to buy and how much they would pay for it. That was a whole new world. And chief executives became responsible for a whole lot of assets and resources, but also for their people. And over the world, Really simple essence focuses on four areas. 
But this is New Zealand based. So how do we make everything that we do in government centered on the customer, centered on the New Zealander? So for example, how do we make it really easy for people to do business with government? Because in fact, most New Zealanders don't give a rat's ass which agency provides their passport. They just want to provide it really quickly and efficiently. efficiently. And in fact, they probably don't want a passport. If you can see them stamp on their hand, because so actually that's the utility, isn't it? The utility is not the document or the process that goes through together. The utility is what it does for you. So in actual fact, New Zealanders just want better public services, and a lot of them can't figure out why we're not going there and doing that for them. The second focus area was results. So how do we focus on the results that really matter to New Zealanders and how do we get together and deliver change? And the areas where Better Public Service is focused on, and now we've got result areas coming out of Better Public Services, they focus on things like long-term welfare dependency. So effectively this is one of those things that guts families and guts communities and guts towns. How do we make a difference there? And what about immunisation rates for children? How do we make a difference there? to the health of our youngest and most vulnerable citizens. And what about violent crime? Because we all care about that. No matter how kind of little we are, that is something that we actually care about. Maybe we don't have poor people in our families and our children are immunised. Stuff like violent crime, you know, that's the heart of everyone. The third area that I really focused on was leadership. What kind of leadership do we need to work together? What kind of leadership do we need to grow to deliver this change? And the fourth aspect was stewardship. So no more of the short-term thinking. How do we as a government work together to create something that's enduring, and not just now, but for the future as well? And I've been a public servant for a long time, and this one I find really interesting, because although I totally believe in it, I worked in the Beehive for four years, and I know what an electoral cycle is. Yeah? And I worked in policy for years too, and I know how much push there was on us working in policy to get stuff delivered within time frames that work for ministers, if not necessarily for New Zealanders. So how do we be stewards of our organisation, of the system, and the things that we deliver for New Zealanders? So these are the four key things, and it's all of us working together and differently. So given that, I want to talk to you about some research that we've done recently around how we're leading our agencies in government. Okay, it's mostly focused on the public servant, but there are some state sector agencies in there as well. And it comes off the back of the performance improvement framework. So how many of you have heard of the performance improvement framework? Okay, it's not for you to review. So it's a review of an agency's fitness for purpose today and in the future. So it looks at a four year excellence horizon. Some of you are serving. If you've been picked recently, you've been done that. Yeah, you met them recently. It's an evidence and judgments based review um, using appreciative inquiry, focused on a future state to make a judgment. It's not an audit. It's not about benchmarking. It's about this agency and this agency within its sector and what it needs to be strong to deliver today and what it needs to be strong to deliver over the next four years, given the objectives of that agency and what government wants it to be doing. So that's the pitch. And you probably can't read this very well, I've done it before, it's in colour. So we're focusing through the pep on the delivery of government priorities. So how well placed is this agency to deliver on government priorities today? And given where those priorities might head over the next four years. And also how well placed are they to deliver on the full services? Because although governments come and go, and they bring with them different ideas about what they want to do, there are some services the public service has always been working with them. So leadership and direction and delivery, external relationships, people development, and financial and business management. How well placed are you? And the purpose of the purpose to get an organisation into a place where it understands how well placed it is and then can plan to get better placed. So we can deliver the future. One aspect of the that I'm really interested in that is this element. It's called internal leadership. And again, it's probably a bit hard to read. This internal leadership dimension of the looks at how well placed agencies are around things like their values, behaviour and culture, their engagement with staff, the way they develop their people. And when you look at this picture here, this covers the 30 reviews that we have done so far. And 
There are not many agencies with strong or well placed across these dimensions, which means that we're not doing the things we need to do for our people, and our people are our greatest asset. So there's a whole lot of loss of value there. Okay, it's the Treasury too. A whole lot of loss of value there. And if you've got really good eyesight, you can see down the end there, even the same thing as the should is very ad hoc and full time. So we've all got some work to do. But based on these results, in many of the state services commissioner commissioned a piece of work. He sent some media reviews out to the world. Now, Debbie Francis and Six Ugly have done a lot of reviews between them and talked to a lot of people and a lot of agencies. And he said, go out and talk to the agencies that are doing this well and find out what they are doing and what we can learn from that. And they published this report. It's called Getting to Great. Your map to navigating the stress on internal leadership. So they went out and they talked to chief executives and people in these agencies and stakeholders to find out what are you doing that's actually working in this space? How are you developing your leaders and engaging your people? What are you doing with your workforce planning and development? And the answers were actually really simple, like all good answers should be. So what these agencies were doing differently, they valued authentic leadership. They created alignment between role, purpose, and organisational culture. They embedded workforce analytics, so they knew what their people were capable of doing and what development their people required, and they knew who their best people were, and they knew how to get their people to where they were needed the most. They provided meaningful and timely feedback, so they were good at that, and also they were reaching for higher staff engagement. Now, none of these agencies were doing all of these things perfectly. This is a bit of a composite of the most perfect agency. But in actual fact, these are all really simple ideas. And they're not just ideas that will work for government and we get good at them. This is relevant to the private sector and the NGO as well. So if we think about things like valuing authentic leadership, we're talking about leaders who bring themselves to work, their true selves, who share their values with the people that they work with, who are open about the strengths they have, but also about the weaknesses that they have and the mistakes that they make and who work with their people in such a way that they understand their people too and their strengths and their weaknesses and what matters to them. So that's the thing to be sure. She sounds kind of doable. So I'm going to ask you a tricky question because, you know, I'm here being filmed. I didn't know I was being filmed. None of you are being filmed. The camera just points this way. And for you, there's a chat and house rule, so whatever you say comes to with you and that's fine. But I'd like you to put your hand up if the person who currently leads you is an authentic leader. Is an authentic leader. Now look around. <laughs> if you work for a skills organisation, don't indicate. Okay, this goes here. Okay. Yeah. It's not enough, really, is it? Okay. It's not enough. Yeah, if you work for me, I'm just going to talk to you about that. Okay. So let's talk about creative alignment. So when we talk about creating alignment between role, purpose, and organisation and culture, that is stuff like, when I come to work and do the stuff I do every day, I know the contribution that I'm making to the success of my organisation. I can see that. I have line of sight. So I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you could describe to a complete stranger the link between what you do every day at work and the success of your organisation. So if you could describe that to a complete stranger, can you put your hand up? Yeah. And that's not really a high enough score in this group here, is it? Yeah. And this goes to the heart of things like employee engagement as well. Because what we know through all the employee engagement tools that we use in the public sector, and the private sector uses a lot of the same tools, is this question about knowing what's expected of me at work is to employee engagement. If I know what's expected of me, then, then I know what standards I need to meet, and I know the contribution that I'm making, and I know the link that I have to the mission of my organisation. So if we're not getting that right, and again, in treasury terms, we're losing a whole lot of value. Many full and timely feedback. Can you put your hand up if in the last seven days you have received meaningful and timely feedback at work? In the last seven days. Okay, less than half of you. Can you put your hand up if in the last seven days you have provided meaningful and timely feedback to someone you work with? Because it comes to our face. And that's the great thing about a lot of us. We're not expected 
PR leaders and managers to fix all of this for us? This is all within our grasp, isn't it? Because a lot of the stuff you've been doing for yourself. So some very simple lessons coming out of this. You know, we have to commission a report to get them, and often it looks that way. And this report is on the State Services Commission's website, and it's backed by 20 or more, I think we're up to about 25 video clips, where we talk to some people about what they're doing. And I want to show you one of those video clips now. You'll love it, it's about concrete. Okay. to a, a new leader in the public sector, Greg Wynne, with really extensive cultural training requirements. Um, advice for you, that's always hazardous. Um, I would um, I'd say take the time to diagnose uh, and make that a, that's for a new leader. That rubric's cute, you talk. Yeah, get, the, get just understand, don't, don't take you know, advice from me or from anybody else. You know, there's a prescription for change because it's likely that the organisational setting is unique and in some ways unique in some ways general way to find out the unique, find out what the trigger is uh, that, that, you can, that you can pull that unlocks things. I remember I went to work in a mill once, big, tough industrial complex and I knew it was a very tough culture and I knew the maintenance guys were quite tough. And I went in and I talked to them one day, and I was talking to them about the direction of the business and the key performance indicators, the need to get results and the rest of it. And this one guy, cranky old fitter from the back, yelled out and said, yeah, just fix my bloody floor. And I looked down at my feet and there was a lumpy, broken concrete floor that we're asking to work on every day. And I thought, yeah, good point. I didn't say anything, I just left it and then went away. And I, I went out to the, to, the, um, to the leaders and I said, why can't we just fix the bloody floor? And they said, oh, what cost of it? And, you know, and they've always bloody asked for it, but, you know, we want to focus on this. And, and I said, let's just fix the floor. And the next day, uh, then I went back through, we fixed the floor, reconquered it, put a really nice little, um, uh, the sort of fiberglass sort of casing on it, so we didn't just do it, we did it really well. Then I went back and said, right, we we'll fixed the floor, can we have another discussion now? And, you know, they were amazing. So I think the, the, the lesson there is that, you know, what's the concrete floor? in the organisation because it's about a visible demonstration of your commitment to them as a leader and to be doing the things that helps them to improve their performance. They want to perform. There's very few people that don't want to perform. Almost everybody wants to perform. They might have a different view of what performance looks like or how to get there, but they want to perform. So if you can get there with the same path as you, and a lot, a lot of the time that's about fixing the stuff that's really irritating them to allow you to move on to another sort of broader agenda. So in your organisation, what's the concrete floor? And it won't always cost as much as that to fix. But it is the thing that irritates people so much that they don't hear the other messages or they don't engage in the conversations you want them to engage in. So this is just one, as I said, of over 20 video clips where we've spoken to people about what makes a difference in organisations and they're on the State Services Commission website. So have a look. Um, there are a range of clips, so you will find some you like and some that don't appeal to you. Keep watching. Okay. Given all of this work that we've done, thinking about internal leadership and government, um, we know we've got more work to do. And the State Services Commission isn't doing this work alone, so we're partnering with the Leadership Development Centre and with Chief Executives and their HR professionals but increasingly we will also be partnering with people outside of government and we've got a new leadership strategy. So the State Sector Act has always enabled the Commissioner of State Services to publish a leadership strategy and to implement it and public service chief executives are now required to support the Commissioner in implementing that strategy. It's for the public service but it can be extended to the broader state sector by agreement. So we've written something we think can go further. So, it's a leadership strategy for state services, it's on the State Services Commission website and what it focuses on is what kind of leaders do we need? Not just today, but into the future. So if you think about that Better Public Services report where it said we need people who can work together across boundaries, we need people who can work collectively and collaboratively. This is not about the great the alpha type leader who gets to the top by competing, 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 we need something different. So the strategy is about how we find those people, how we build those people, and how we do it collectively. We need leaders with more diverse backgrounds, you all know that. So when you look at the public service, we've been talking about diversity for a long time. Um, we're not even hitting our straps around gender diversity. 
led by the other forms of diversity, um, including thought diversity, because that's pretty critical too. See something not in them. Yeah? We need leaders with more diverse backgrounds, experience, and skills to win the confidence of all New Zealanders. We need leaders who can work collaboratively across boundaries. So that's what the strategy is about. And the State Services Commission is working with its partners, focusing on two particular areas of leadership pipeline over the next couple of years. So we like to focus on everyone, but we just can't. When you focus on everyone, you actually get nothing done. So we're focusing firstly on the very most senior leaders. So the people who occupy our senior leadership roles and key positions within government. So they are critical to delivery on things like emergency management. They are the head of workers who come into the and family. So we're focusing on those leaders as one of our first priorities. And we're looking at what those leaders need to develop, where the next crop of leaders is coming from and how we develop them as well. And we're working in a new way on this. So instead of chief executives developing people within their own agency, their own agency, they're working together on career boards. So a career board is a group of chief executives, in some cases in two completely different sectors, and they are collectively responsible for developing the group of leaders that they own across all of those agencies, and they are collectively responsible <coughs> for creating a succession pipeline and developing those successes. So this is a fledgling process, and it's kind of crunchy, but it's really interesting, because all the incentives for a very long time, since 1988, have been for chief executives to develop the people they need. So now we are asking chief executives to provide development opportunities for people they don't own, and to sometimes take one for the team. So for example, to enable one of the excellent people who they desperately need to deliver on the next thing for their minister to go somewhere else because that's what would serve the development of that person. Or maybe to release that person they really need to deliver on something for their minister to another agency because the government priority, the priority for New Zealanders is more critical over there. That's all new. The other area that we are focusing on with our partners over the next couple of years is junior leaders. Because we know if we can get it right early in career, then we get it right for the whole of people's careers. So we're focusing on graduates who join the public service. And as I said, this is about public service, but we like more friends in the broader state sector. And at the moment, some agencies are doing really well with their graduates and others are not. And what we want to know is that over the first two years, there are some particular experiences and networks that those graduates develop. And they really, truly learn to be public servants. So we focus there. And the next stage on, on emerging leaders. And not all emerging leaders will be graduates. So these are high potential people wherever they come from who we think could be leaders. They are either in or ready for their first management role. And again, some agencies look after their emerging leaders really well, and others don't. So what we're interested in is ensuring that all people who are emerging leaders have some particular forms of development and experience at that stage of their career, which increases the likelihood that they will go on to be good leaders, and it's great for people that they lead if they get that support as well. So those are the areas that we focused in. Really excited about the leadership strategy for a number of reasons. One is because I am a public servant. I haven't always been a public servant, but I am now, and I love it. So when people ask me where I work, I say public service. Yep. And as you would have heard my CV, I'm a bit of a mongrel. I work everywhere, and I always will. But this is the potential for a leadership career across the state services. And so even within the public servant, public service, there's a potential for a leadership career comprised of kind of 40,000 people, which is pretty exciting. And if we can get broader, that's kind of 200,000 people. And if we can create leadership careers across 40,000 people or 200,000 people, what about other forms of career? So I think that's the beginning of something big. I'm also interested in this, actually I'm obsessed about this, because we know we need to lead differently if we're going to deliver New Zealanders differently. And this has the potential to lead differently to deliver the stuff that you do in this world. And even when I'm not being a public servant, I'm also being a public servant. Pretty exciting. So my question is how you will help us, because actually we can't do this even with the partners that we have in the 